to stop talking about Henry the Fourth Part Two um, at nine. I hope that's nine fifteen uh, to give us about ten minutes to go over those. They ranged uh, from A to D, and the ones that were D's were failure, follow directions. Uh, I think one didn't have a works cited page. I think one or two did not have the required number of sources quoted. Um, you know, almost almost all of the things required two quotations from each of the plays because almost all of them were over two of the plays. Um, I think one had one quotation from each of the plays. I think one had two quotations from one play and then not a quotation from another. And it was on one of the topics that uh, had the two. Anyways, we'll talk about those um, when I go back. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to revise for a little bit higher grade. Um, second part of Henry IV. How many of you, have any of you read this before or seen it before? Um, any of you finish it for today? I, you weren't required to by any means. I, I'm going to try. I'm not going to promise, and I, I know this won't happen, but I'm going to try to get through Henry IV, Part Two. if not by the end of class on Thursday, by the middle of class a week from today, so that we can um, get into Hamlet and hopefully still be able to do The Tempest as our final play um, for the semester. The exam for the two Henry IV plays, because those will be the only two um, histories we'll be doing, is probably going to be objective. Uh, haven't figured out exactly how yet. I mean, it'll probably be, it will be D12, because we don't have time to um, use a class period for that. Um, but I'll talk about that more later. So, how did Henry IV Part One end? Anybody remember? <coughs> Who won? Put it that way. Henry the Fourth, thank you, because I mean this is obviously Henry the Fourth Part Two. Uh, what else? Um, I don't think I knew that he was a foreshadowing of false fascination downfall and stuff like that. Okay. Hal kind of distances himself. Um, steps in, begins to step into the role. If you remember his first soliloquy. <coughs> in the first play, what does he say he's doing? And again, that's in the first act. He tells us he's acting. The, the whole thing about the dissolute youth, that's all a charade, okay? And he does it in the context of saying, so that when I reveal my real self, what? I'll be like the sun, and I'll dazzle men's eyes, and all that kind of stuff. What we're going to see in this play is he's lived such a raunchy life for his first years. What happens with that throwing off that bad character? It takes some convincing. Your introduction goes, I mean, almost the, almost the entirety of the introduction is about Hal's realization, you know, reputation sticks. And it's hard to unstick it. He has to do an awful lot, okay? And that reputation is with whom? He's got two different audiences, right? For his reputation. And? And his father. We're going to see in this play, even though he defeats Hotspur, okay, with, with a little caveat, a little asterisk or footnote on that, right? Because who does everybody believe defeated Hotspur? 
Falstaff. Hal gives Falstaff the glory, all right? <clears throat> Which probably, you know, those on the inn don't believe anyways because it's Falstaff. But we're going to see in this play, there's a, a famous scene in the middle of it when Hal thinks his father has died. And he goes into the room where his father isn't sleeping, and he sees the crown, and the crown is laying on a pillow. And Hal picks up the crown and puts it on his head and starts to imagine what it's like being king. And he puts it on his head and he feels this enormous weight. It's not. It's, it's not like the king's crown today. It's just a circlet of steel, essentially, all right? But the king wakes up. And he's like, what? You can't wait till I'm dead? It's telling us, even after everything Hal has done up to that point, it's still not enough. He still has the stain on his character, right? That image of a stain on one's personality, one's character, one's soul, I won't say that that permeates Shakespeare's plays, but it's in an awful lot of them. We didn't talk about you know, the end of uh, As You Like It, but you know, when you get to the end of As You Like It, what do we see happen to Duke Frederick? Anybody remember? He has a right to leave the throne and leave the start to live a monastic life. He meets a priest, <laughs> and he becomes, to use Shakespeare's language, a convertite. He converts. That play, from the beginning to the end, is about transformation. Transformation is the word that uh, Bevington likes to use a lot. Or reformation. About reforming the character. You know, you have the old Adam, the character, and then you have the new Adam, the reborn, Duke Frederick, etc. Okay? Well, the reason I'm kind of talking about this now is we're going to see a lot of that in this play. And then we're going to get to Hamlet. Mm -hmm. Hamlet is probably the most religious play that Shakespeare wrote. Maybe, maybe with a little few exceptions. We could probably talk about The Winter's Tale because that's all about death rebirth, death, and resurrection. Whether it's real death and real resurrection, you know, it's kind of unimportant. Um, or The Tempest, because Tempest is largely about forgiveness, renunciation, and rebirth, okay? We see Shakespeare wrestling with that with this, however. This is, what, 1597, 1596, something like that, right after. I mean, it's Henry the Fourth, Part One. Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Because it's like you turn the page and you open the page, and no time has passed. Right? Look at the very beginning. How does it begin? Enter rumor, painted full of tongues, and that probably means rumor comes out with this costume, with tongues, gaping mouths all over it. Why? What is rumor almost never? True. Okay? Rumor comes out. Open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? Notice rumor is loud. It's not silent or it's not quiet. It's not little subtle whisperings, okay? or at least not as it's portrayed here. Why? What does rumor, how does rumor usually work? Why do people often believe rumors? Because they're compelling. They're compelling. Keep going. Why are they compelling? Because they're true. Okay. 
a little more because the people already have little inklings, little assumptions or presuppositions. And what does the rumor do? It confirms those ideas that one already has. Okay? So, open your ears, for which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient, the Orient, what does Orient literally mean? East. Okay? It literally just means East. So when you orient yourself, that term, what that literally means is you face east. Okay? If you're disoriented, you're not facing east. And, and what we mean usually by that is you're wobbly, you're off balance, you're not facing that direct area. And the reason you use east as a way to orient yourself is because that's where the sun rises. Exactly. So it's like it's pretty like that you know it's east because that's where it's because how many of you could pick out the North Star at night? Okay, some can. I learned how to do that over spring break. Okay. But the sun never rises in the south. It might rise south of east, but it's always generally in the east because of tilt in the seasons, right? It's going to go a little bit off east. But on uh, the summer equinox, summer solstice, what does it do? It rises due east, okay, depending upon where you are on the planet, you know. So, I from the Orient to the drooping west make the wind my post horse, still unfold the axe commence it on this ball of earth. I make the wind my post horse, the horse that carries, horseman that carries the post, the meal, okay. So what does the wind do? It blows the rumors from the east to the west. And what rumors are, what are the rumors that it blows? The acts performed on this ball of earth. That's, you know, obviously, just think what Shakespeare would have done <laughs> with this kind of stuff. Headline news and such. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace while covert enmity, under the smile of safety, ruins the world. Wow. I speak of peace while what? Covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. I won't talk about current politics. I'll talk about politics 80 years ago, 85 years ago. No, 86 years ago. Neville Chamberlain goes to Munich. And we get the Munich pact. He comes back to Great Britain and he waves the papers and says, I have got peace in our time. And I'm not slamming Chamberlain. Read Winston Churchill's eulogy on Chamberlain's death in the fall of 1940. He hails him as a great man, even though Churchill thought entirely wrong. Chamberlain thought what about Hitler? That he could be trusted. While enmity was still, you know, being planned and such. Just like FDR thought, you know, good old Uncle Joe, Stalin, not Biden, could be trusted. Not really. And who but rumor, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepare defense, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. That is, People think war is about to come, but it's not. Okay? And what, is it, what do you do when you think war is about to come? Hopefully, if you're prudent, you prepare for it. How do you prepare for it? Well, if you're a king, you got to raise taxes so that you can feed and, and raise an army. Bear in mind, all throughout this period, England does not have a standing army. 
Standing armies don't become de rigueur until 17th century at the earliest. You raise an army to fight a particular battle. And when that battle is done, or a particular war, when that battle or war is done, they go back home, all right? It's really only in the 19th and 20th centuries that we get these massive, standing, permanent militaries. So, rumor is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures. Surmise, what's a, what do you do when you surmise something? We don't use that word very often. We use assume. Surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, like a hydra, the still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it. Notice what metaphor has Shakespeare just used that he's going to use again in Hamlet? Somebody playing on a recorder or on a pipe piccolo, flute. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? What is rumor saying there? All you out there in the audience, <laughs> you're, you're like me. You live in my home. You eat my food. In other words, I've got you. Why is rumor here? And rumor at that point, probably, I've seen a couple of different collections, rumor at that point probably goes something like this. Here, right here, right now. See, rumor here is not part of what? It's not part of the actual play. It's like when Shakespeare writes a prologue. Henry V begins with a prologue. Prologue comes out and says, here we are in this wooden O, and says, imagine that this is the field of Agincourt, 1450, all right? Goes on. Here, I don't need to tell you this. You guys eat and drink of my hearth. I mean, you're well known here. Why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory. Run before. What does that mean? Now, you can't say before means before the victory is actually achieved. You know, what did George W. Bush famously, stupidly do? Famously, not other stupid things. This one's the big one. He flew a jet onto an aircraft carrier. He flew a jet, National Guard, back in the 70s. Not a problem. And when he landed on the aircraft carrier, what did it have on the tower? Anybody ever know? Big old sign. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Mission wasn't accomplished yet. We were not done in Iraq by any means. How do we know? <laughs> we're still there. That was almost 20 years ago. All right? <clears throat> I run before Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops. Okay. Quenching the flame of bold rebellion, even with the rebels' blood. So I'm going before, and rumor tells us what happened at Shrewsbury. And this is true, what rumor says here. Okay. But what does Act 1, Scene 1? What do Bardolph, Porter, Northumberland not have? <laughs> they don't have truth. Well, I shouldn't use this either. <laughs> Proof! <laughs> why, why do I say you shouldn't use this either? We could read Othello, and Shakespeare's Othello is about a guy. He's a Moor, black Afri uh, e African, North African, maybe Egyptian who comes to suspect his wife is cheating on him. And he does that because he's been led to believe that his wife is cheating on him. He needs a per certain piece of proof or evidence that she's cheating. And that piece of evidence is a handkerchief. Okay? 
He's made to believe that when he sees a man, his kind of right-hand man, give a handkerchief, a very specific handkerchief, to his wife Desdemona, he, Othello, is led to believe that that means this guy has slept with his wife. The only reason he, this character I'm not going to name, and his wife Desdemona have that handkerchief in the first place is because Othello originally gave it to his wife as a sign of his love for her. And when he sees this other man give it to her, he thinks she left it with him. Oops. And he says, I won't believe that that has happened unless I have the ocular proof, can see it with my own eyes. And that's why later on, Iago, the evil guy, arranges things so that this character gives her the handkerchief. For Othello, that's the ocular proof. What would ocular proof be for infidelity? Catching them in the act. Paolo and Francesca in Dante's Divine Comedy. They, real characters, real people, they get caught having sex by her husband. He runs them both through with a sword. And so they are forever in hell, chasing after each other in the flames of whirlwind of passion and such. Okay. Rumor, rumor knows what the truth is. But the people that rumor is blowing to don't, right? Because this isn't what rumor says, right? To those out there who haven't yet heard what happened in the war. So, but what we I to speak so true at first? That is what I've just said. No, 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 no. My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of Noble Hotspur's sword. It's my job to do what? To say that Hal died. Though we know from part one, Hal didn't die. Under the wrath of Noble Hotspur's sword and that the king, before the Douglas's rage, stooped his anointed head as low as death. So Hotspur killed Hal, and Douglas killed the king. That's the rumor that's going forth. This have I rumored through the peasant towns between the royal fields of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hole of ragged stone where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. He's talking about Annick Castle, which is by any means not a worm-eaten hold of ragged stone. You go to it today, it's massive. It's the second largest continuously lived in castle in England. The Percy family, the Northumberlands, have been there since the 1200s. And they're still there. When I used to take a course to to a, my Harry Potter course to England, we would always go up to Anna Castle, and every now and then we'd go through the library, and there's the Duke's table, his desk, big desk, all his family pictures, because the castle would be open certain hours a day, and when it closed, it's like the family came back out of the, out of the cupboards and stuff and lived their normal life, okay? So what is rumor doing? The king is dead, the prince is dead, the rebels are victors. How often, in the heat of war or battle, are initial reports true? How often in riots and whatever are the initial reports? Even with all the technology we have today, they're seldom correct. The posts come tiring on. And not a man of them brings other news than they have learned of me. Okay? From rumors' tongues, they bring smooth comforts false. Worse than true wrongs. Why are the 
Smooth comforts false. What are we going to hear in the next 60 lines? Bardolf comes in. And what's he tell Northumberland? And notice how he does this. So, um, line seven. <coughs> Northumberland asks, what news, Bardolf? Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. That is, we should be planning. We don't have any time to waste. We need to lay out our strategy. His point is, I need to know what happened so that we can adjust our strategy. I bring you certain news that is 100% correct. Good. The king is almost wounded to the death. And in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, slain outright. And both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John, Westmoreland, and Stafford fled the field. Now, what does that mean? We have a phrase, turned tail and ran. They were cowards. And Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk, Sir John, <laughs> talking about false stuff, is prisoner to your son. Harry Monmouth's brawn, his henchman, Brawny, you know, large, stout. Why? Because he's grossly fat. He's now a prisoner to Falstaff. Again, we, the audience, have seen the first part. Now notice, everything he's just said is what? False. Entirely. Because it's thought, by those who were at Shrewsbury, Falstaff killed Hotspur. All right? So he says, oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly worn. Fairly there can mean beautifully, and it can mean in a fair manner. It was an even fight, so to speak. Came not till now to dignify the time since Caesar's fortune. Do you mean a victory like this since Caesar's time? How is this derived? That is, how, how did it occur? Derived means, what is the literal, literal source for this? Saw you the field? Where did you get your information? Did you see it yourself? And what do you really mean by that? Did you see Harry Monmouth dead in the mud? Right? Came you from Shrewsbury? The telltale sign of it's not going to be right. I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence. What is almost never allowed in a court of law? Hearsay. Hearsay. I heard from Buzz from one who said. Okay. A gentleman well bred and of good name. Okay, first of all, a gentleman, that's a social status. That's not just a nice word for somebody who's nice. Okay, well-bred, has a long family history, okay, and a good name. That freely rendered me these news for true. He swore these were true. What, is, what does it mean when you do a rendering? Like an architectural rendering. You're doing a drawing of what the thing's going to look like. What is that not? It's not the real thing. Okay, there's a huge, you know, and we're kind of back in the cave, right? The image versus the real reality of it. Notice how false the image is here. Okay. Northumberland, here comes Travers, who I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. Okay. Bardolph, I overrode him, that is, I beat him on the road. I passed him on the way. 
He is furnished with no certainty more than he may ever retail from me. Oh, you don't need to pay any attention to Travers. Is essentially what Fardolf is saying. But Travers comes in. So the first word Northumberland learns, and remember, Northumberland is sick, okay? He wasn't feigning sickness so as not to go to battle against the king. He is really ill. So Travers comes in. It says, uh, talks about some things, and I want to pick up about five lines in. So this guy, Sir John Umbro, asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. Okay. He told me, Sir John Umbro, that rebellion had a bad luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. And notice how um, Northumberland takes that. Oh, so hot spurs become cold spur. He who was full of life, full of the phrase that Bevington uses to describe Falstaff, joie de vivre, he was full of you know, energy and bustling and is now cold. See any young Hotspur's spur was cold of Hotspur cold spur that rebellion had met ill luck? So now what's the problem that Northumberland has to face? I've got two competing views of truth. <laughs> which is true, which is false. Or we can use 2024 language, which is misinformation, which is disinformation, which is malinformation. Okay. Bardolf, if my, if my young lord, your son, have not the day upon mine honor for a silken point, I'll give my barony. That is, if anything I've said is wrong, and what does he base it upon? Upon mine honor. What did Falstaff say about honor? And what did he call it? Anybody remember? I misspoke two weeks ago because I said, you know, it's like this. A Nike swoosh? It's not like that. Because everybody knows what that is. That stands for something. He calls it a mere escutcheon. An escutcheon is simply uh, an image on something that is designed to draw your eye to it. The image has in and of itself no meaning. It might just be a flower. Why? Because flowers are pretty. That's it. It is just something to distract the eye. Falstaff is saying that's all honor is. I'm not saying Falstaff is correct. Shakespeare's not saying Falstaff is correct. But Shakespeare does want us to consider and think about what is honor. Because you have Hotspur's version and you have Falstaff's version over here. So those are what? Those are the two extremes. Where's the truth? <laughs> Usually somewhere between those two extremes. Upon my, what honor does Bardolph have? He says he's honorable. So? Northumberland, why should the gentleman that rode by Travers then give such instances of loss? Why, why would he say something that's not true? Who, he? He, he was some Hilding fellow, you know? That had stole a horse and rode on. Look, here comes more news, right? And more news always means what? Better news? More complete news? I really want to go into politics, but I won't. <laughs> so, Morton comes in. And Northumberland says, this man's brow, like to a tidal leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. The tidal leaf, the tidal page in a book. You know, is the book just called, or the play just called, Julius Caesar? Is it just called Hamlet? 
or just called Lear, or no. It's the tragedy of King Lear, Julius Caesar, etc. Morton comes in and there's a look on his face that Northumberland can read very well. So looks the strand whereon the imperious flood hath left, but anyway, hath left a witnessed usurpation. He's not talking about just the normal ebb and tide of the waters of a river or of the ocean on the shore. He's talking about, you know, when you get big floods, what do they do? They leave debris everywhere. This guy's face, Morton's, has debris written all over it. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord. He doesn't mean I ran tail tucked between my legs. He means I haven't stopped, essentially, from Shrewsbury to here where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party, our party, the rebels. How doth my son and brother? What's doth? How are they? How, are they? How do my son and brother? What tense is that? Present. We would say, how are my son and brother, all right? Thou tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is after than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Why does Northumberland say thou, thou tremblest? What might that be a verbal example of? Stage direction. Because Morton should kind of be jittery. Now, that could be because he's run, not, not literally you know, run, but he's ridden from Shrewsbury to Northumberland. Shrewsbury is near the border of Wales. Annick Castle is on the other side of the island in England, 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 nearly with the border of Scotland. It's a good 100 or 200 miles away, right? So he could be from that. Or it could be trembling because he doesn't want to bring bad news to his employer, essentially. He says, you know, your face is probably what King Priam's face was like in Troy. <laughs> when word reached him about Troy burning and etc. Seventy. 76, this thou wouldst say. Let me back up. Even such a man so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead and look, so woe begone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night and would have told him half his Troy was burnt. But Priam found the fire ere he is tongue, and I my Percy's death ere thou reportest it. This thou wouldst say. Your son did thus and thus, your brother thus. So fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. That is, you would fill my ear with their bravery, with their acts of courage. But in the end, <laughs> that is, when you finally get down to the end of your report, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. What's his point? What did their courageous deeds get them? What did their bold deeds get them? They're still dead. Is this because he's against bold deeds? He's against courage? He's against honor? No. This is because he is a grieving father. This is a gold star father, you know. Morton. Douglas is living. Yay. 
And your brother, he's still alive. But for my Lord, your son, why he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion has. Suspicion, not rumor. What's Northumberland just told us? This is how I thought things would work out. I think he's saying, even before Bardolph and Travers came in, um, I didn't think we could win. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanted. Look at that again. I mean, we could literally spend an entire class just taking apart that sentence. It is so packed with meaning. He that but fears the thing he would not know. He that fears something that he doesn't want to know the truth of. Why doesn't he want to know the truth of? The thing. Because it confirms the fear. Is it better to be left in doubt than to know the truth? You talk to, you read, don't talk to, you read accounts. And there are some people who have family members go missing. But they would rather not know the truth. Why? Because there's always that possibility that family member may return. You know the truth. And, you know, odds are, it's, it seems, they're not returning. Okay, they're dead. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct, gut instinct, knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. What's the other's eyes? It's Morton's face. I can, you, know, you didn't even need to say anything. Knew before you even spoke. Yet speak, Morton, tell thou an earl his divination lies, his divination, his prophecy, my reading of the future, so to speak. That is, my reading of the future before you spoke was, my son is dead. And then you spoke and you confirmed it. Look, I'm a prophet. And I will take it as a sweet disgrace and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. That is, I'm going to reward you for wronging me. How did he wrong him? He brought me news of my son's death. Morton, you are too great to be by me, Gain said. <laughs> I'm not going to oppose you. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's See a strange confession in thine eye. That is, there's more. Thou shakes thy head and holds it fear or sin to speak the truth. If he be slain, say so. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. Bardolph says. Bardolph still can't believe it. Morton. I'm sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. Would to God, I wished. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state. Well, who else saw him in bloody state? Let me rephrase that. After Hal kills Hotspur, who does Hal see, quote unquote, in bloody state? And then Hal leaves, and what does Falstaff do? No, did yet. And he gets up, you know, and he goes and stem Hotspur's body. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed to Harry Monmouth. Prince Hal, the dissolute. 
kill your son. You're, you're, his son's death could only be worse, maybe, if Falstaff actually had been the one to kill him. Whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth. Notice, swift wrath. Why, why, why that implication? Why the swiftness? Like an avenging angel. Okay. The never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In view, his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp. What's he telling us about Hotspur and, you know, the grunts, the people who join the army because, you know, they're going to fight this great cause and such. He, to use part of his name, spurred them on. Being brooded once took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his troops. For from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves. In other words, once Hotspur fell, what happened to the rebellion? It fell apart. Because the thinking kind of is, oh, if he's dead, we're screwed. They turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. And the thing, and as the thing that's heavy in itself, upon enforcement flies with greater speed, so did our men, heavy in Hotspur's lots, lend to this weight such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Nice little simile there. As arrows fly directly to their target, our men fled from the field. <laughs> Hotspur had courage and bravery. The rest of the men of the rebellion, not the lords, not the Douglases and the, you know, those kind. The peasant warriors, they turned tail. Then was that noble Worcester too soon taken prisoner, and that furious Scott, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king. That is, men who pretended to be the king, decoys, disguises, and veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. That is, even Douglas, after thinking he killed the king three times, one of those was blunt, okay, he was taken as he was retreating. The sum of all is that the king hath won and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord. In other words, tick tock, tick tock. Under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. Excuse me, this is the news at full. This is the whole news, okay? Northumberland. Notice, for this I shall have time enough to mourn. Meaning, what's time enough? It's like the rest of my life, right? He will always mourn the death of his son. But, he kind of goes on, now we need to do some things. We need to get ready. <clears throat> so, he throws away his crunch. Why? I kind of wonder if J.R. just hit me, if J.R. Tolkien had this image in mind when he has the character of Denethor throw away his crutch after Gandalf speaks to him and restores his courage to him, and he rises up to become his greatness. He is Northumberland, the largest county, I think it is, the largest county in England. He's got a huge number of troops. Which is why the others said, first part of Henry IV, when they found out Northumberland wasn't coming, maybe we should wait. And Hotspur's like, no, more glory for us, you know. 
So he throws away his crutch, and he says, a scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand, and hence thou sickly coif, and he takes off his nightcap. Why? Because it's going to get replaced with a helmet. Now, line 153, now let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. What's nature's hand and what's the wild flood? I don't know if you put no answers that. Nope. I think the wild flood is the spirit. What keeps the spirit confined? The body. Let not nature's body keep my soul, my spirit confined. He's going to go all berserker is a possible interpretation. Keep the wild flood, let order die, and let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention. Let me slow down. Let order die, and let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. You got a long footnote down there. But let one spirit of the firstborn came Reign in all bosoms. What does that mean? Sarah's like, what the hell? <laughs> this came under the flood. First act of what? Not just murder. Think, uh, Fred, okay, think larger. As the Family is the smallest basic unit unit of society, and if you have fratricide, what do you what does that become when you magnify it to a society? Civil war. Let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses. And you got that word courses which implies careers, not career like job, but career like the race that one is set, okay? Or path or journey. But it sounds like what? There's another English word, sounds exactly like that. It's spelled differently. Courses. How do you pronounce that? Nope. That's that. Corps. The Marine Corps. Obama famously referred to the Marine Corps as the Marine Corps. And we, you know, a lot of Marines were like, dude, we're alive. A Marine Corps is a dead Marine, okay? <clears throat> On bloody knees. Courses. This was a pronunciation and a word in Shakespeare's day. We've seen it in, I think it was the first part of Henry IV, the word's already been used. So let one spirit of the firstborn king reign in all bosoms that each heart being set on bloody courses, bodies, the rude scene may end. What scene? What did Jaques famously, you know, go off about, and then I think it was act three or act four of As You Like It. Um, All the world's a stage, etc. On bloody courses, the rune scene may end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. What does that mean? Dark, notice, not darkness be the place of the dead, because when you're six feet under, it's pretty dark. Darkness be the barrier of the dead means this. <laughs> Slowly. Doesn't work as well as the light signal and the zoom. Lights out. End of the play. End of the story. What's he suggesting? Loose the dogs of war. Cry havoc and let loose the dogs of war is a line from either one of the Henry the Sixth or Henry the Fifth. I can't remember which plays. 
Okay. So, let's sit down metaphorically and have a talk about Northumberland's mindset at this point. What's he thinking? Oh hell. <laughs> let's just do it. Let's just go. Ain't you know what crazy? They kill everyone. Why? Because we all end up dead. Period. That's kind of Lear's final mentality. Lear is one of the bleakest plays Shakespeare wrote in that sense, in terms of that understanding. Macbeth is much bleaker than Lear, okay? So, Bardolph, this strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. Um, back off the cliff, <laughs> Lord Northumberland. <laughs> you're, you're, you control yourself. Who does he sound like? His son, you know, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Morton, sweet earl, divorce not wisdom from your honor. There's that word. <coughs> Who did divorce wisdom from honor? Hotspur. Divorce not wisdom from your honor. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your help. That is, everybody who's still alive in the rebellion, they what? They depend on you. You can't think only of yourself. The which, if you give over to stormy passion, must perforce decay. Notice, what should be in control of the human person? Reason. The reason should control the will. He's letting his gut control. Why? Put yourself in his shoes. You just found out your, your son is dead. You had an inkling. You thought this could happen. Now it's been confirmed. It was your, line 168, it was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. Notice, in your pre surmise that's like pre-assumption well when you assume something you don't know that it's the case but it's a pre so in your pre-pre in your assumed assumption what you thought yeah you Harry could die yet you knew he walked over perils on an edge more likely to fall in than to get over the boy walked a tightrope in everything he did. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit. What does forward mean? Eager, Eager outgoing, <clears throat> almost to the extent of leaving the body, not literally, but kind of pulling the body along, and the body's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. You might not die, that is the spirit, but I'm flesh and blood, and bullets will stop me, you know? <clears throat> His forward spirit would lift him where most trade, trade of danger, trade, commerce of danger, the heat of the battle. In other words, Hotspur isn't going to be one of, wasn't going to be one of those generals who sat in the back with binoculars looking how things were. He's going to be up front leading the charge. And yet you did say, go forth. What usually comes after that go forth in a military context? It's part of a quotation, if I remember correctly. I don't see it. He doesn't have footnotes. There's a phrase, go forth and conquer. And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff born action. What hath then befallen, or what hath this bold enterprise brought forth more than that being which was like to be? Now, what has Morton just said? You knew. 
Is it just that you knew this was a possibility? He said, go for it. What the real import? You're in Northumberland shoes, and you hear that. How do you take that? I would. You said you're friends with that. Do you see this? You blame me? <laughs> That's how I would take it if I were Northumberland. Okay. Notice Bardolph. We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous end. We understood the possibility, okay? So, Morton goes on and says, the Archbishop of York is up. That is, the Archbishop has an army. He's ready to come to you. We, we're not done, we're not down and out, we're not defeated. We can still win this, we can still turn this around. Okay. So, Northumberland, end of that scene. I knew of this before, talking about the Archbishop and such. But to speak truth, this present grief had wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, counsel every man, the aptest way for safety and revenge. Notice, if they're just counseling for safety, then that means what? CYA, cover your backside. You can't get revenge if all you're concerned about is your safety. Get post letters, make friends with speed, etc. And then we get Falstaff. With a page boy, the Chief Justice comes in. We're not going to talk much about this scene. If you read the introduction, Bevington points out Shakespeare structures this play exactly the same way he does the first play. You get a serious scene, a comical scene, a serious scene, comical scene. Comical scene almost always involves Falstaff. And he, I think, wrongly suggests at the beginning of the introduction, he says, Shakespeare wrote to Henry IV quite soon after one Henry IV, perhaps in 1597, partly, no doubt, to capitalize on the enormous theatrical success of Falstaff, and partly to finish the story of Falstaff's rejection. Notice by having that as the first sentence, what the importance is. It's Falstaff, rather than Hal's story. Could be right. I kind of don't think so, okay? Falstaff is important in this play for one major thing. He is the foil for Hal. That is, I don't mean he's just a foil. He's the major foil. There are other foils. Henry IV is a foil. Prince John is a foil, right? But Falstaff is the great one. In the first play, who's the great foil for, for Hal? Hotspur. Is Falstaff? Yes, Falstaff is still a foil, okay? So, what do we see in this scene, just briefly? The Chief Justice comes in, and he's there primarily for one thing. Or let me rephrase that. He wants to do one thing, but he can't. What's the one thing he would like to do? The Chief Justice puts Falstaff up in jeopardy. Why? Because he's the, the Gadshill. Bingo. The Gadshill robbery. Why wasn't Falstaff put behind bars before? Because there was a war to fight. The war is over. Yeah. Boy, I'd like to throw you, you know what, behind irons. But he can't. Why? Because now he's slain the leader of the rebellion. He says, I am loath, this is line 146, I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit, exploit on Gad's Hill. It has notice. A little gilded over. It's covered your wrongs with a little bit of gold, so to speak. You look a little bit better now than you did before. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or opposing that action. It's only because of what you did in battle that you're not in jail, okay? So, 
The Chief Justice, they go on and talk a little bit more. Falstaff talks about virtue, etc. Chief Justice, one, eh, about line 200. The king hath severed you and Prince Harry. You're not going to have anything to do with the prince. I hear you are going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Remember, Lancaster, John, and Westmoreland are going to march against York, the Archbishop of York, in Northumberland. Falstaff is now going to be in their vanguard. He's going to go along with them. Why? Because he achieved a great victory at Shrewsbury. Okay. So Falstaff thanks him and says, you know, pray for peace, etc. 1 3. We get the Archbishop of York. Okay. He comes in with Mowbray and Hastings and Bardolph. And Bardolph says, in response to the Archbishop, um, line 27, Bardolph says, it was, uh, it, it was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with project of a power much smaller than the smallest of its thoughts, and so with great imagination proper to madmen led his powers to death and winking leapt into destruction. Everything he's talking about there is based on what? The same reality as rumor. Notice, eating the air on promise of supply. Well, what, is, what does that mean? That's talking about when they were initially planning the battle, you know, Glendower said, we've got this map, we're going to divide it in thirds, etc. And you're going to have Glendower's troops, you're going to have Mortimer's troops, you're going to have Northumberland's troops all come together to fight at Shrewsbury. Who ends up fighting? Only Hotspur's troops. The others don't show up. That's the air of promise of supply flattering himself with project, like projection of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. Why? Because Hotspur had big ideas. He merely thought, if I march into battle, the implication is, if I march into battle, we're going to win because of my great renown and such. Okay. Hastings, it never did, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Meaning, let's quit talking about the ideas and get down to what? The reality. Let's look at the number of actual troops before we march off into battle. Okay? So, 41, Bardolph. When we mean to build, and he goes on with a building metaphor. When we get ready to build a building, what do we do? We survey the plot, we figure the model, we figure the house, blah, blah, blah. Okay? What's his point? We went into this rebellion how? Not having a plan. We didn't have it all worked out, okay? So he says, you question your surveyors, you know our own estate, line 53, how able to such a work to undergo and such. Hastings, 66, I think we're a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. Okay, so who's the mean, even as we are? Northumberland's troops, Archbishop, Archbishop of York's troops. How many troops do they have? 25,000, we're told. Or the Archbishop has 25,000, excuse me. So Bardolph says, oh, so are you saying the king has but, that is only five and 20,000? Hastings, to us no more, nay, not so much. That is, to us, it will seem like he only has 25,000. For his divisions, as the times evolve, 
are in three heads. That is, he will only have 25,000 to fight us. Why? Because the king isn't only fighting us. Who else does he have? He has one power. He has one army fighting the French. Right? He's got one army fighting Glendower. A for, perforce, a third must take up us. The kings stretch too thin. Why does every empire fall? Spread their forces out too thin. Every empire in the history of humanity has fallen because of that. So is the unfirm king in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness, that is, and he's out of money. His point is, the king doesn't have the financial wherewithal to do what? Raise more troops. Okay? One of the things that, that often caused throughout English medieval and early Renaissance history that caused the populace to turn against the crown was, as it seemingly always is, excessive taxes. Because what were the taxes for? They were, not, they were never for the people. They were never for infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. They were always for the kings fighting wars. I mean, go back to John. Go back to before John, Richard II, all right? Archbishop, that he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance, strength, need not be dreaded. We don't need to worry about the king drawing those three armies all together to fight us. Why? Because that would leave France unchallenged and it would leave the Welsh unchallenged. He's not going to do that. Barlow, who's, who's likely to lead his forces against us? Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland. Again, the Duke of Lancaster is how old? 15, 15 16 maybe? Okay. Against the Welsh, King Henry and Prince Hal are going to fight. And I don't know who's going to fight the French. Hastings says, Archbishop, let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. That is, let's write a declaration of independence. That's to publish the occasion of our arms. Let's go forth and spread the word why we are marching against the king. Let us announce to the populace what we're doing. He's suggesting that for one reason. We'll draw people to our side. Because generally speaking, most people, doesn't matter nationality, ethnic origin, etc., most people don't like tyrants. And if you have an opportunity to overthrow one, they'll generally throw their hat into the ring. Okay? So, Archbishop goes on. Um, now, we'll stop there. So we're going to pick up with Act 2. I did not get near it where hope to eh, not too far page wise um, pick up with act two I'm gonna like I said try we won't get through all of this on Thursday um, there is a lot I'm, I'm gonna skip I'm gonna skip a lot of the comics um, but let me go over these papers where did I put them Brooke, Alyssa I don't use red intentionally Ellen, Heather, Yeah. 
Kindle. Okay, so let me do the, the important part first. You can revise this, okay? Um, turn it in a week from today with this. Because I need to be able to check. I need to be able to compare the two to see how you revise it. Um, revise it, turn it in with this. Don't staple them together though. Um, you know, paper clip them or something. Um, and you can earn up to two grades higher. So if you had an E, it could go to a B. If you had a C, it could go to an A. If you had a B, obviously it could still just go to an A. It doesn't go like a double A, you know. Um, where did I put it? And I, I'm doing that for one reason, mainly. As I was reading some, a couple of these were, were fantastic. I mean, the, the writers did, exactly kind of what the topic addressed. The others, so those were A's, the others had one issue or another. Some of them had many issues. I should have explained when I went over this in class. The first important, the first sentence of each topic is the most important one. All the other questions are merely designed to get you thinking. Those other questions weren't necessarily questions you had to address, okay? They were questions designed to help you think, as an example. Um, number six, discuss, I don't remember, only a couple of you I think did this one. Discuss the theme of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Bingo, you do that. Everything else after that is designed to help you think about what is the theme, how does it work, et cetera. So, how does the title relate to the theme? It may not. Probably does, titles usually do, okay? Um, how does the play within the play of Pyramus and Thisbe relate to the theme, okay? Does the dream relate to Plato's allegory of the cave? Notice it's a question, it's not a statement. It may not to. It may not, okay? I discussed the allegory of the cave because of Theseus' speech, largely, but it also because it deals with dreams and reality and such. You didn't have to necessarily try to shoehorn somewhere, one or two people did, you know, the allegory of the cave. I'm, I'm thinking of one paper, you know, it just kind of was, Plato's allegory of the cave it just got stuck into the paper and it didn't really fit, so to speak, okay? Um, how does Theseus' speech at the beginning of Act Five tie in? Notice that question, how does it, implies it does. The question, does something, that's open-ended. It may or may not, all right? Um, obviously, the easiest thing to do Errors, fix those, <laughs> okay? Um, if you didn't have enough sources, get the sources. Uh, you know, that's a basic, simple thing to um, fix. If you didn't have a works cited page, make sure you have a works cited page. Um, and an, another thing about the works cited, when you're referencing multiple works, you need to have multiple works on that works cited page. So if you did two of the plays, almost all of these asked you to address two of the plays, you need to have a separate entry for A Midsummer Night's Dream and one for As You Like It. Um, did I email that or did I just post it in the content? I think I emailed. Uh, with the sheet that has paper topics, I also included a document uh, Sherman's Guide to Successful Papers or something like that. It's like six pages about citation, citing sources, introducing sources. You shouldn't have quotations floating in your paper. Quotations need to be anchored to an introductory tag or a sentence of some kind, as do paraphrases and such. Um, if you're quoting, that document is how to quote long passages. Several of you quoted six, seven, eight lines, and it was just all within the body of the paragraph. 
with, with poetry and drama, anything over three lines ought to be indented. Ought to be blocked, quoted. It's all double spaced still, okay? Um, and there should be examples in that handout of how to handle, for example, the two sources found in a single anthology. One or two of you, not just the ones who got A's, one or two of you um, did the cross-referencing thing where you had William Shakespeare, as you like it, Bevington, and then you gave the page numbers. And then you had a separate entry for David Bevington. So I had Bevington, David, comma, Ed, Shakespeare's complete works, and then publication info, info. And so when you had the Shakespeare, William, period, as you like it, comma, Bevington page numbers, that tells your reader, me, that the source is in this edition. Whenever you cite uh, something, write a paper like this or for any other English course, you, you've got to have that edition cited. You can't just say William Shakespeare's As You Like It because there are different editions and the editions follow different sources. For example, when we get to Hamlet, very quickly, when we get to Hamlet, Act one, scene two, Hamlet gives his first soliloquy. In that first soliloquy, there is a reading, there is a word that differs between the earlier publishings of Hamlet and the first folio. Oh, that this two to sullied flesh is what the earlier editions of Hamlet read. And the first folio says, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a deal. Those are very different readings. They mean two entirely different things. It's thought by most editors, this was Shakespeare's intended one, and this is probably an accident. Because this is the easier, re I'll talk about this when we get to it, principle of textual editing called lex difficilior. The more difficult reading, this is the easier reading. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Well, flesh is solid, and it can be melted and thawed, etc. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh means what? Corrupted. Corrupted, dirtied, stained. That's a more difficult reading because of what Hamlet is saying with the felt, thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew. That's talking about a process of what? Purification. If you melt, thaw, and dissolve ice, you get water. If you take water and boil it and put a copper tube or some kind of tube so that when the steam rises, when it comes out, it's what? It's distilled water. It's now pure water. There is no sullying in it. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew. That is, become purified. Hamlet then goes on, or that the Almighty had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. It's the first talk of suicide in the play. It's the most important one. To be or not to be is not important in terms of suicide. That's that first um, scene, okay? Uh, if you have questions, email me or see me afterwards or before class, um, and I will try to explain better. I don't know what, I, I noticed, you know, reading over those, some of those afterwards, trying to read my chicken scrawl. <laughs> I was actually sitting at, you know, a table, and I'm like, what has happened to my hand? Anyways, I apologize. Yeah, the best of us. I've had people say you're the wrong kind of doctor. <laughs> yes. 